Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Dr. William Lane Craig. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, if there are any people uh, out there, Dr. Craig is an American analytic philosopher and Christian apologist. He is a visiting scholar of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. Dr. Craig is probably the most prolific and well-known defender of a Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. This argument was originally formulated by the famous Muslim theologian and philosopher Al-Ghazali, who died in AD 1111. But it has acquired a new lease of life, thanks entirely to Dr. Craig's celebrated and prolific defense of the argument. Today, Dr. Craig has kindly agreed to discuss two subjects. Firstly, he will outline for us the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God and look perhaps at some of the objections that have been advanced against it. And secondly, we will discuss his latest book on his quest for the historical Adam. This is the first human being in the light of scripture, Christian scripture and modern science. So, Dr. Craig, to start with, could you outline for us the historical origin of the Kalam cosmological argument and what form the argument takes? Certainly. The argument originated in the attempts of early Christian commentators on Aristotle to refute Aristotle's doctrine of the eternity of the world. Aristotle believed that God and the universe were co-eternal, mm. and because of their commitment to the biblical doctrine of creation, certain early Christian commentators uh, devised very clever and sophisticated arguments against the past eternity of the universe. One of the most important of these was named John Philoponus, who died in the fifth century. Mm. Uh, and this tradition was absorbed by Islam when Islam swept across Egypt uh, and Alexandria, where Philoponus was active. And it became the centerpiece of uh, Islamic um, philosophy uh, and natural theology. And mm -hmm. as you say, it was developed into very sophisticated forms by someone like al-Ghazali, who was actually the heir to several centuries of tradition. So it's an argument that has a great intersectarian appeal. It's been propounded mm. uh, by Jews, by Muslims, by Christians, both Catholic and Protestant. As for the formulation of the argument, Ghazali's formulation is perhaps the simplest and most accessible. It goes like this. Premise one is that everything that begins to exist has a cause of its beginning. Premise two is that the universe began to exist, and from that you can conclude three, therefore the universe has a cause of its beginning. And then you do a conceptual analysis of what it is to be a cause of the universe, and several theologically striking properties of this uncaused first cause emerge from such an analysis. The argument, I think, if successful, proves the existence of a beginningless, uncaused, immaterial, changeless, spaceless, uh, timeless, personal uh, creator of the universe who is unimaginably powerful. Well, that, that, that's very helpful. But Looking at premise one there, uh, and, and there have been, I've noticed in, in looking uh, into this in a little bit of detail that every statement of the cosmological argument, the kind of generic uh, label for all the variants that we see, including the Kalam cosmological argument, that they have been countered by others and then counter statements have been made and everything is contested. But w w one of the, I think, one of the more interesting objections to premise one of your uh, argument as you formulate it, whatever begins to exist has a cause. And a common objection appeals to the phenomenon of what's called quantum indeterminacy. This is in, in physics, obviously in quantum mechanics, where at a subatomic level, the causal principle, everything that begins to exist has a cause, 
appears to break down. Things apparently just come out of come into existence out of nothing, almost ex nihilo. And there's a, a famous founder of this, um, uh, Lawrence Krauss, the Canadian American physicist and cosmologist, in his book, which is entitled "A Universe from Nothing." He actually literally states, at least the title states, that something came from nothing. And this would appear to uh, 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 challenge the, 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 the premise, the first premise of your argument. How would you respond to that? Well, I think uh, there are a number of ways to respond. In the first place, we need to understand that any physical theory is comprised of a mathematical core, the equations that are the center of the theory, and then there is a physical interpretation of that theory. And in fact, with respect to quantum mechanics, there are at least 10 different physical interpretations of the mathematical core of that theory. And some of these uh, theories are fully deterministic theories. So it's simply not true that um, quantum mechanics is a proven counterexample to the principle that every uh, event or everything that begins to exist has a cause. Hmm. Secondly, the premise is formulated in such a way as to allow for there to be uncaused events. It, the premise is not every event has a cause, but everything that begins to exist has a cause. That is oh. to say, things can't come into being without some sort of causal antecedents. But that's right. perfectly uh, consistent with saying that the time of a, the decay of a radioactive isotope, for example, is indeterminate. Um, what the premise excludes is that things, substances, can come into being out of nothing. And that leads me to Lawrence Krauss's uh, deliberate misuse of science in this regard. Krauss knows that the word nothing as he uses it is being used equivocally. He does not mean non-being or not anything. What Krauss is talking about is either the quantum vacuum or quantum mechanical fields, which are quite definitely something. Uh, and so his models do not in any way suggest that it's plausible that the universe could come into being from literally nothing, that is to say, non-being. Indeed, when you think about it, Paul, there is no physics of non-being. <laughs> physics only applies the moment the universe begins to exist. So it, it's impossible for there to be a physical explanation of how the universe could originate from nothing. That's a metaphysical question. Perhaps the, the, the title, I don't know, maybe the publisher, uh, rather than himself, uh, who knows, thought of the, the, the title of the book, A Universe from Nothing. But nothing doesn't really mean nothing, because there is a quantum, you, you spoke of a quantum field, which is something. Yeah. Presume, perhaps, I don't know if it has mass or not, but presumably there's energy, there's probability waves, whatever. There, there's something going on there, which is not nothing. So exactly. You, so your, your your premise then, premise one, would would, would seem, therefore, to to uh, not be defeated. Um, put, put it exactly. So long as we understand that premise one expresses a metaphysical principle, uh, I think that it's quite secure uh, and that there is no good reason to doubt its truth. Hmm. Uh, another objection, which is what, what one I, I think has some uh, some plausibility, uh, mm -hmm. unlike perhaps Klaus's, Klaus's one, is your characterization, your conclusion, rather, this is not a premise, this is a conclusion, that uh, therefore, ergo, an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists. Um, now, I don't quite get the, it seems a little bit like a non sequitur. I, I, okay, I, I grant that you've established that there is an uncaused cause, a necessary right. being, perhaps. I see that from the contingency of the universe. But to, to describe this God in, in, with all the adjectives that you attribute to it or him, uh, shall we say, is still quite a way, I think, from the God of classical theism, let alone the God of the Abrahamic faith, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, mm -hmm. of, uh, and, and so on. Uh, there seems to be quite a gap, um, a metaphysical gap, or, uh, that you haven't quite justified in any detailed way. 
Um, could you oh. elaborate why, why you think, therefore, uh, the God of Abraham, to give you a generic? Yes, ac- actually, I have elaborated this in quite a detailed way in my published work, but this tends to be ignored by people who are just responding on YouTube videos. I go through each of those properties that I mentioned, yeah. timeless, spaceless, uncaused, immaterial, enormously powerful, uh, and give philosophical arguments as to why this first uncaused cause must have that property. In particular, and this is very important, I give three independent arguments as to why this cause must be personal, so that we're brought not merely to some sort of an impersonal first principle, but to a personal creator of the universe. And so I would refer our listeners today to my book, Reasonable Faith, Um, Look at the chapter on the arguments for God's existence, and you'll find these laid out. Now, in making the transition to the God of the Abrahamic religions, there, I think the argument doesn't take you that far. The argument gives you a kind of generic theism that is common to all of the world's great monotheistic faiths, including deism. Deism would be perfectly consistent with the argument. To move to the Abrahamic faiths, I think we have to look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth and ask ourselves, who was Jesus of Nazareth? Because he claimed to be the exclusive and decisive revelation of the God of the universe. Uh, And so it will be on that basis, I think, that we will determine whether or not deism or Judaism or Islam or Christianity is true. And as you know, as a Christian philosopher, I'm persuaded that uh, Christianity gives us the best account of who the historical person Jesus of Nazareth was. Yeah. And that, that is, of course, as a separate argument from the Kalam cosmological argument, which is to do uh, with the existence of an uncaused cause. The the arguments for uh, and against the uh, who Jesus was an historical person are a separate set of considerations and have been yes. investigated by biblical scholarship the last 2,000 years, and uh, but many historians have concluded that Jesus himself didn't think he was God, for example. But that, that, that's a, a separate uh, issue from this, uh, this argument. It is. But, In fact, uh, after I finished my hmm. doctoral work on the Kalam cosmological argument at the University hmm. of Birmingham under John Hick, we moved to Germany, and I did my doctoral work in theology under Wolfhard Pollenbach, on yes. this very question of the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. So yes. those two bodies of work complement each other in making a full-orbed case for the Christian faith. I think, I think that uh, someone might say that your, your, your arguments you propound for the cosmological uh, argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, are, are very good. They, 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 are, they, are, they are highly respected. Um, generate a great deal of interest and have a lot of plausibility, mm. rigorous philosophical. I, I think the argument for the historical Jesus believed that he was God, for example, and this is a separate issue, we're not discussing this today, are, are, not, are not beliefs that are widely held by uh, historians <laughs> of the historical Jesus. For, for example, E.P. Sanders yeah. and, uh, and others. Okay, now, you, you the, said we weren't going to discuss it, but you just we said something there that I need to respond to. Okay. One of the surprising things that came out of this study at the University of Munich was the realization that the central Mm -hmm. historical facts that undergird the inference to Jesus' resurrection are, in fact, agreed upon by the wide majority of New Testament critics today. And these would be the honorable burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb, the discovery of the empty tomb by a group of Jesus' women followers on the first day of the week after his crucifixion, the post-mortem appearances of Jesus to various individuals and groups, and then finally, number four, um, the very origin of the disciples' belief that God raised Jesus from the dead, despite every predisposition to the contrary. So I think the historical facts are pretty firmly established. The question is, what's the best explanation of those? And there you're quite right in saying that a good many scholars will say, well, that's not for us as historians 
to speak to. That That's a different question, and so they will remain agnostic about it. I wasn't referring to the resurrection at all. I, I, mean, I was talking about Christology, the understanding who the person and nature of, of Jesus, and my impression, I, I could be wrong. And the reason I mention this is to... The, the, the rigor, the philosophical rigor of your the Kalam argument, that, as you articulated, is very strong, I think. But yes. to, to, to couple that uh, it, it, as if they had equal um, uh, probative um, strength with a, a, a claim that Jesus uh, claimed to be God, I'm not talking about the resurrection, God, is it, something I don't find in, in, his, uh, in mainstream historical research at all. In fact, the, the consensus, as I understand it, is that Jesus understood himself to be a prophet, an eschatological prophet. That seems to be the overwhelming consensus of scholars, rather than uh, the second person of the Trinity and so on. The argument about the resurrection is a separate issue to do with an historical event, which the historical critical method, as you know better than I, is not really able to address, because how do you address a supernatural... Uh, you may think there are very good arguments for it, by the way. But, 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 but the, the point I'm making is uh, your initial claim that Jesus... Uh, thought he was God or was God, uh, uh, the, the God that, you, that the cosmological argument points to. And I, I think one argument is much stronger than the other uh, in terms of the academic work that I've looked at. Well, I would invite readers again to read what I've written on this. Um, this uh, I published my doctoral work that was done at Munich. I think it's rigorous. Uh, and I don't claim that Jesus uh, claimed to be God. What I argue is that Jesus claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, the Son of God in a unique sense, and the Son of Man prophesied by the prophet Daniel. Uh, and that these radical personal claims were ratified by God's raising him from the dead, so that we have good reason to believe that Jesus is, in fact, God's decisive revelation to us uh, in human history. Yeah, so the claim that he was uh, believed himself to be a messiah or seen as a messianic figure is 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 more uh, widely accepted by historians than the claim yes, that he was God indeed. or called himself God or believed himself to be God. I think it's that claim that I I, 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 I was surprised to see you uh, putting on the same level as your the very strong. Uh, well, those, those were your words, Paul. I didn't say that. Um, Okay, I what I said was that we have good reason to believe that Jesus is the decisive revelation of God to us. And I think that's on the basis of the personal claims I mentioned, and then God's raising him from the dead. Um, and I, I, I think that this excludes looking at Jesus as merely a human prophet. In my no, 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 that's fine. We're, we're always not here to debate that, but I uh, thank you for your clarification of exactly sure. what you, you, you do believe. That's extremely useful. Uh, on the subject of very useful things, I, I have looked at the uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the online uh, article on the cosmological argument, because there isn't a thing called the cosmological argument I've discovered. It's actually that's more like a type of argument, and there are yes. many discrete variants uh, or instantiations or manifestations of this uh argument uh, of this type. Anyway, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Online has a very useful article, I think, uh, discussion of how the argument developed from Plato and Aristotle through Al-Ghazali, who we mentioned, Hume, of course, and Kant had a great deal to write about it, up to the lively contemporary debate to which Dr. Craig has made such a seminal uh, contribution. So I, I do, I don't know what you recommend that or not, but I thought it was a, a very, very uh, helpful article. And you can just Google the Stanford Encyclopedia philosophy. So, and he mentioned you many times, of course. So, um, well, thank you. For that. Perhaps moving on to the, uh, the our second subject for discussion, and this is your latest book, uh, published just last year, um, entitled. Um, I, I like the title actually. In quest of the, <laughs> in quest of the historical Adam, a biblical and scientific. Exp the reason I like it is because obviously you're referring um, to. The, the classic in the quest of the historical Jesus and you're exactly very good Paul I'm glad you picked that up on that that, that, that is a, a, um, an interesting um, reference there to to that and I like I like that anyway in in this book which I confess I, I have not read but I, uh, so apologies for that um, where you set out uh, I'm told you set out to answer the questions about Adam now this is the first human being of course through a detailed biblical and scientific investigation so I think a really important place to begin uh, our discussion is to understand the scriptural basis of this. 
And um, obviously, Adam is referred to the beginning of the Bible in a book called Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created Adam uh, and Eve. This is found in Genesis 1 to 11. They're usually tr treated as a, 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 a discrete uh, section like that by scholars. So according to biblical scholar, what kind of literature is it? What kind of genre is Genesis chapters 1 to 11? This is the critical question for the interpretation of these passages. And I argue in the book that these chapters exhibit family resemblances belonging to ancient Near Eastern and contemporary myths. Especially these narratives try to ground the realities and the values of the contemporary author and his society in events of the deep primordial past. This is called etiology, and the, this motif of etiology permeates these first 11 chapters of Genesis. And yet at the same time, these stories also are structured along a kind of backbone of genealogies, listing historical persons uh, and their descendants, which terminate in indisputably uh, historical persons like Abraham. And so I accept the genre analysis uh, called mytho-history. Uh, that is to say, these are stories about events and people that really happened, that really lived, but it is told in the figurative and colorful and imaginative language of myth. Mm. Well, that's very teasing. Uh, very teasing indeed. And yes. I, I I, I, just like one thing I might disagree with you on that, about the indisputable historicity of Abraham. One of the things that shocked me when I went to university and I, I was asked to write a, an essay on Exodus, you know, Exodus of Israel from Egypt and by Moses, when I was told very clearly by my professors that Mo the, the existence of Moses was far from being an accepted historical reality. And Moses True. was much later than Abraham. Um, I, I think people like Abraham and Moses are usually seen. Now, this, there, there are some have been developments recently where some prominent uh, experts in the field are, are now talking about the evidence for Moses existing. And I, I on faith believe that Abraham existed, of course, but I, I'm not sure it's an historically established figure in history. Yes. Uh, Abraham, I that's mean. fair. That's that's a very fair comment, and I think um, if I were to rephrase what I just said, I would say that the genealogies um, terminate in persons who are indisputably presented as historical characters, uh, as opposed to say mythical figures. Uh, Abraham and and his descendants are not presented as mythological figures, but as real historical persons who give rise to uh, the nation of Israel. So uh, I accept your, your correction uh, in, in that. Well, that's very gracious. But I, I just want to also clarify what elements then of the Genesis story of Adam and Eve, of course, and there are two creation narratives, but presumably you're alluding to the second creation story rather than the first one for your detailed understanding. How much of that is myth and how much of that is history? And more importantly, how how on earth does one make that, that decision? How does one hermeneutically engage the text and say, well, this element, the eating of the of the, 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 the fruit uh, is myth. I don't know what you believe on this, but say it is. But the fall itself is history because the fall itself of Adam and Eve is a prerequisite. It, it's a really an absolute um, foundation for Christian soteriology. Uh, obviously, uh, in, as presented in the New Testament, that you have a fall and then you have a second Adam. The second Adam yes. is Paul calls him, Jesus, I mean. Um, so you've got to have that. But are you saying that these details of the fruit and the tree and the, the serpent and whatnot are, are not historical and, and myth? Is that your argument? Or Yes, that is my, my position. I would say that these are mythic images um, in which the story of the fall is told. So that while there was an Adam and Eve who did commit some sort of sin against God, I think this is told in the dramatic imagery of a tree of good and evil and then a tree of life and a talking snake who seems to be a symbol of evil and so forth. Uh, mm. And I suggest a number of ways in which one can discern which portions of the narrative are 
meant to be understood figuratively and, and which are not. My question, how, how do you make that hermeneutical move? How do you discern mm -hmm. what is and what isn't? So that was really my question. Well, one way would be when the narratives relate things that are explicitly contradictory to what the author of the Pentateuch believes. And a great mm -hmm. example of this would be that in chapter one, he presents this image or picture of God as a transcendent creator of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we have here this transcendent God who creates all of the universe. But in chapters two and three in the stories of Adam and Eve, you have these very anthropomorphic descriptions of God yeah. as a sort of finite humanoid a deity who is walking in the garden, who forms Adam out of the dust of the ground, who does surgery on Adam and takes out a rib and makes a woman who is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, calling out to Adam. And this is clearly incompatible with what the Pentateuchal author himself believes about God. And so I think gives us indication that these descriptions should be understood as anthropomorphic uh, imagery. That's interesting. John Calvin, if I remember rightly, the uh, the Reformation uh, scholar and pastor and so on, uh, if I remember right, at least in English, it's, but, uh, remarking on this kind of language in the second, because there are two creation accounts. People may not know this in Genesis. It's not like there's just one account of God creating Adam and Eve. There are two mm -hmm. accounts. And some scholars would say that they are mutually contradictory. And you seem to be implying that they are contradictory. So you prefer one, the earlier rather than not the chronologically early, I mean, chapter one rather, rather than chapter two. Um, but the, Calvin seemed to be uh, suggest that God uses language. He lisps to, uh, to his children. He uses language yeah. that people can understand, not sophisticated uh, intellectuals, but so-called ordinary people can relate to this. And this was the purpose in using this language, which um, is not to be taken. I, I think he is implying, uh, but he didn't say this, not to be taken with you know, scientific precision, perhaps. Yes, I, that's exactly right. This is the so-called accommodation theory yep. of inspiration. Uh, and it, that has to be true when you think about it. Even in revealing himself in Hebrew or Greek, God is already accommodating himself to the limits of human language. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's not at all surprising that God would further accommodate himself in um, making things so simple that everyone can understand them and not just philosophers or modern physicists. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge, uh, huge relief. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the, the standard academic uh, understanding of the Pentateuch, which you uh, mentioned, is the so-called documentary hypothesis, that in fact, we, we're actually seeing at least four um, separate distinct authors, JEPD. Now, I know this has come under some criticism and there have been some refinements of it, but nevertheless, the fundamentals still seem to be intact in Old Testament studies. The idea that, mm -hmm. that Moses is definitely not the author of, of Genesis or Pentateuch at all, the first five books of Moses, I mean, that he didn't actually write them. And indeed, nowhere in the book does it claim that he did write them. And uh, so th it, the point I'm getting at here is not just to mention that the authorship question is quite interesting uh, that Moses didn't write any of this anyway, it would seem, according to most scholars today. But that the second creation account is written by someone other than the first creation account. And so it's not surprising we had two different people with different outlooks and understandings of creation and God himself, one very transcendent, uh, of a very, uh, a very uh, attractive to philosophers, and the second, very anthropomorphic, as you say, where God is portrayed in a, as a humanoid figure who gets involved in the, you know, asking, well, where are you, Adam? And he's sort of asking in the call of the day, you know, um, a, a very, very different portrayal. So w would another way of looking at this be to say we're, we're looking at a scripture which is not entirely harmonious and consistent because of its multiple authorship by different people with different views of God, the Elohist, the priestly, the Yahwist, the Deuteronomist. I mean, these are these are the technical terms for the four documentary authors of documentary hypothesis. W would you be comfortable? I have, a, I have a nice discussion in the book 
about the sources behind Genesis 1 to 11 in terms of both source criticism and form criticism. And fortunately, with Genesis 1 to 11, which is the center of our attention, only the J source and the P source come into view. The other two don't even play a role yeah. in Genesis 1 to 11 and so can be left aside. And there's no reason or, or argument or evidence that these are, in fact, written documents rather than oral traditions, which were then collected uh, and put into the final form by the Pentateuchal author. Uh, and so uh, I think the final authorship of the book is, in one sense, really irrelevant. What's important is this pre-literary tradition that gets taken up and put together. And I think you're absolutely right it, that it's very clear, even to the English reader, that in Genesis 1, you have a different tradition than what you have in Genesis 2, and that the Pentateuchal author uh, juxtaposes these without very much concern about ironing out any sort of inconsistencies uh, between the two. And I think, again, that is characteristic of myth. Um, the authors of myth are not terribly bothered by logical inconsistencies or fantastic elements, um, because that's not the main point that they're trying to make. The only thing I, I would add here, though, Paul, is I would follow uh, the commentator Klaus Vestemann in saying that what we have in Genesis 2 is not a second creation account. Genesis 2 contains nothing about the creation of the heavens, the sun, and the moon, and the stars. Rather, it's a, it's a story about the origin of humanity, and as such, it resembles other ancient Near Eastern Mesopotamian myths about humanity and how it came to be. So I think in Genesis 1, you do have a creation story, and then in Genesis 2, the focus radically narrows uh, down to the earth, and you have a story about the origin of humanity. Yeah, no, I think that, that, that's a fair, fair comment. Um, now, moving, changing gears slightly, and I've been looked at the, the genre question, which is actually a fascinating uh, area of, of, of study, according to biblical scholarship. Um, you, you assert, and, and uh, I understand why you do that, Adam was an historical individual. He, he reappears in the New Testament, of course. Uh, he, he's mentioned on the lips of Jesus in the uh, in the Gospels, uh, mentioned by Paul, and so on. So, you know, we, we are constrained to accept his historicity if we are to take this, uh, this scripture with great seriousness. But the right. question is, um, when did he live? Uh, and and, and, th and this, this kind of goes into the whole issue of contemporary scientific accounts of human evolution. So we're looking at when did he live? Uh, and we, we're going now into archaeology. We're going into genetics or whatever it is you propose we use as a way of determining the age of the human race that we as contemporary people are physically descended from. We're sons of Adam, literally, uh, I, I think. So could, could you just explain how you connect this up with yes. when we lived and, and the contemporary scientific accounts of human evolution. Yes. The question of when humanity originated on this planet is a scientific question, not a biblical question. And I think we can first set up some very broad parameters. I, I think that when you get to the beautiful cave paintings, for example, in France, at Trouvet and Lascaux, these are clearly the products of human artists. They are beautiful, breathtaking uh, images, so that at least by this time, humanity is, is already there. Yeah. On the other hand, if you push far back into the past, I think when you get to Homo erectus a million years or so ago, then yeah. you're dealing with hominins who have a brain case that is too small to support modern human consciousness. So that sometime in this window between Homo erectus and these beautiful cave paintings, humanity originated. Now, what I try to do in the book is to close that window more tightly to determine mm -hmm. the time at which um, Adam and Eve existed. And what I point out is that we are looking for people like us in the past, 
when did people like us first make their appearance? Mm. And that will involve not simply anatomical similarity to us, but more importantly, cognitive behaviors Mm. that we exhibit. And the um, anthropologists Sally McBrady and Alison Brooks list four of these modern cognitive behaviors, including things like planning depth, abstract thinking, technological innovation, and symbolic thinking. Now, obviously, those are intangible. We, we, we can't detect them. I was going to say, that those are wonderful criteria, but how on earth do you connect that with the archaeological? Yes. Uh, well, what so I- Brady and Brooks say is that we have to look for what they call archaeological signatures right. of these modern cognitive behaviors. And so they list around two dozen of these archaeological signatures that give evidence for symbolic thinking or technological innovativeness or planning for the future. And it is stunning how deep into the past these archaeological signatures go. On the basis of these, I argue that humanity did not originate with Homo sapiens, that in fact Neanderthals and their descendants, Denisovans, were equally human uh, with Homo sapiens, that they also exhibited these modern cognitive behaviors. And therefore, the origin of humanity must go back even further to at least the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And this is the so-called Homo heidelbergensis, or hmm. Heidelberg man, who yeah, had a brain capacity. There was some guy called Heidelberg who was, was, was he a German guy who discovered this, was he? I, I don't know. But, well, it's named after the city of Heidelberg, oh, where it? the jaw of this um, hominin was first found. Oh. Um, and then, since then, it's been found in various places around the world. Uh, right. And so this suggests that humanity originated somewhere around 750,000 years ago. Uh, we don't know exactly where, perhaps in the Middle East, perhaps in Africa. Uh, but then from then, it spread into Africa, where it evolved into Homo sapiens, and into Europe, where it evolved into Neanderthals and Denisovans. So that we all are part of this common human family. Yeah, so this is very interesting. You said something, because I haven't read the book. I I, I confess I have ordered it, by the way, so it's arriving tomorrow (laughs) after the interview, not before. But, hey, that's that's the way it is. Um, I'm fascinated by what you just said there. I wasn't expecting you to say this. You said that it looks as if humanity had their origin in the Middle East, not in Africa, because the prevailing popular perception, uh, it may not be based on the latest research, of course, is that we all came out of Africa, but you're saying the Middle East, and then went into Africa. That I was very surprised to hear that. Yeah, that that is an option. Uh, the famous out of Africa migration is talking about the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa into uh-huh. Europe and the Middle East. But that's far too late. Um, I've already pushed the origin of humanity back to the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Uh, And that could have been in the Middle East. It could have been elsewhere. And then Mm. these Homo heidelbergensis migrated to these other areas where, geographically isolated from one another, they evolved into these different human species. Right. Now, my my kind of next question is going to bring in the Quran here uh, as a Muslim, but I'll just mention this. Mm. But in the Quran... um, it talks about Adam being a special creation of God. OK, and this is like non-negotiable, really, for, for, for many people I've sp- spoken to. Um, you know, you, you can believe in evolution. You can believe in macro evolution of uh, other species. But the red line, the line in the sand is Adam is a special creation of God because he is spoken of in those terms. Interestingly, in the in the Genesis account, we have a similar kind of story where Adam is also a special creation. And by, by, what I mean by that, I mean a supernatural, miraculous creation by God, ex nihilo. Perhaps on the analogy, and, and the Quran itself gives this analogy, of Jesus, Jesus being born of a virgin, his conception 
is wholly without male input, shall we say. Right. Um, yes. It's a miraculous thing. So scientifically, of course, that, that, that can't be accounted for. But that's OK, because it's a miracle. Uh, in the yes. same way, the creation of Adam is also analogously, and the analogy is drawn in the Quran, uh, uh, with Adam. So my question to you is, where do you fit into, do you, do you identify with this spectrum of views? Do you posit an Adam who was supernaturally created by God, as it says in Genesis, or do you have a more, a different understanding of the trajectory of the evolution of hominid forms that became something else. You know My I mean? book leaves this an open question. Oh. The question that I'm interested in is when did humanity originate on this planet, uh, not how. So in the book, I assume, for the sake of argument, the standard evolutionary account and try to show how the existence of a historical Adam and Eve as a founding pair of the human race is consistent with what we know from uh, modern paleoanthropology and evolutionary theory. But if someone wants to say, well, these original uh, members of Homo heidelbergensis were created uh, out of the dust of the earth miraculously by God, uh, he's certainly open uh, to believe that. Um, my my theory doesn't um, take a position on that. Okay, no, that, that's fair. You're, you're agnostic on that. For that, that's fine. It just seems to me that the the biblical scriptures require that, or at least state that, uh, in pretty unambiguous terms. Um, well, and, and... I would say, Paul, that that's only true if you read these narratives in a literalistic way. But if I'm right that this is mytho history and not to be read literally. I think it's quite consistent with the creation story in Genesis 2, where God forms Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. That mm. this is a figurative image for God taking a pre-human hominin and mm. elevating it to the status of full humanity uh, by see, right. infusing a rational soul into this form. Right. So if there was uh, an account of the supernatural dimension in what you've just said, it would be the, as you put it, the infusion of a supernatural soul into. Yes. This uh, and there may have been a biological. There might have been a biological miracle involved as well, maybe a systemic genetic mutation that would uh, enable this hominin to support the capacities of a rational soul. But yes, as, as a dualist, uh, who thinks that we're more than okay. just bags yes. of chemicals on bones, that we have souls, that would definitely be a supernatural element, the infusion right. of a rational soul. Right. So you're a Christian. Obviously, you're a dualist. Uh, I'm, I'm also I'm an idealist, philosophically speaking. So it's very similar to that. There has to be some uh, top down um, input, if you like, as well as a, a bottom up input in terms of the, the, the end product. If I can use that crude language, you, you'd accept that, obviously. Yes. Yeah. OK. Fair enough. Um, well, I think um, that, that I, I've come to the, the end of my uh, questions and you've been very generous in, in um, hearing my questions and my pushback on one or two points. It's uh, very kind of you. And um, uh, you are a prolific author. I, I was uh, very impressed to see a very, very long list of books. I wouldn't begin to recite the, the litany of works you've done. But do you have, dare I ask, do you have any further projects in mind? Or, or is this exhausted your your, oh. your effort? <laughs> I have not exhausted my research at <laughs> all. I have now embarked okay. upon... My greatest project, which is to write a multi-volume, systematic, philosophical theology. Wow. I'm anticipating that this will take about 10 years to complete. Wow. I have finished the first volume, which is on doctrine of Scripture, doctrine of faith, and doctrine of God. Mm -hmm. And I am now commencing the second volume and currently working on the doctrine of the Trinity, which I think you would find very interesting. Um, so... I am having a great deal of fun doing this. It is tremendous challenge, but I'm learning so much every week, uh, deepening my understanding of philosophical theology, and uh, therefore really, really enjoying this great project. Well, that's, I, I'm, I'm glad I asked, because that's an extraordinary piece of news. So you're very much in the tradition of Thomas Aquinas, his summers, you know, the Summa Theologica and the, uh, the Summa Gentiles. 
John Calvin and, and his great uh, work as well. And you're kind of in this tradition of systematic theologians, even, or systematic philosophers. Yes. Summers. This is the, 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 the summer of William Lane Craig. That's, that's what we know known <laughs> in, in, in history. Okay. Now, um, re, uh, people, by the way, can uh, explore Dr. Craig's library of writings, videos, and podcasts on his website, which is called reasonablefaith.org, reasonablefaith.org. Dot org, where I think there's this huge library. And, of course, you have a YouTube channel or two, I think. And mm, fact, yes. Um, you, you're, you're found all over the place, actually. So, But um, I, I do just mention, again, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy online article on the cosmological. I, I was I was just found it so so helpful in really clarifying the, the history and the, the debates of this. I think it's a perennially, perennially interesting argument, and I think it yes. works. Yeah, and... Um, Credit to you, sir, for keeping this very much uh, in the public uh, mind. Uh, and um, it's, it's been, I think, I think your presentation of it has been the, the, the most published and argued about presentation of the argument uh, in, in recent decades. It, it's been uh, very, very well argued about. Um, is there anything in, in conclusion, uh, by the way, you'd like to say about either of these subjects uh, to, to our viewers before we close? Well, only that if there are some of our listeners who are not yet uh, believers, I want to encourage them to look at the evidence because I believe that um, the best uh, and most plausible um, view of reality is Christian theism. And I would simply encourage them to look at the evidence and arguments with an open mind and an open heart. OK, that's uh, fair enough. Yeah, I certainly would encourage people to look at all the evidence with an open mind and open heart, whatever conclusions they reach. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, for your time and your expertise and your good humour. And um, I'm very much looking forward to reading your book on the quest for the historical Adam. I'm sure there's going to be much uh, uh, of interest in that and your and your forthcoming summa, as I'm now going to call it. <laughs> Um, uh, because that's what it is, it sounds like. So uh, thank you very much for your time, sir. Well, thank you, Paul, and the Lord bless you. And you too. Until next time. Mm -hmm.